welcome everybody to another episode of the Nerdcast. I am very happy to be joined by Bo. <laughs> and Mr. Daniel, how are you tonight? I am the Senate. Hi. And Henry, how are you? Unlimited power! Okay, you're right. Uh, let's get that one. <laughs> and <laughs> Philip Seymour Hoffman, okay. <laughs> oh, beyond no. <laughs> real. His powers have doubled since the last time. <laughs> <laughs> God. What a Ric oh, Flair. No. Re- reclaiming my time. <laughs> Potatoes. Potatoes. Thank you so much for joining us and putting up with all of our craziness. You didn't even here. introduce me, damn it. Are you ready now? Have you composed yourself, sir? Like I think so. Head. Oh, God. That first business doesn't, doesn't count. <laughs> Go ahead, Austin. Say hello. <laughs> Not from a Jedi. Ooh, yes. You sounded like a Sith Lord. Well, it was going to be, don't worry, <laughs> we're still flying half a ship. <laughs> well, in case everybody can't tell by all the like craziness going on behind us and all the ridiculous dialogue, we are going to review Star Wars uh, Revenge of the Sith today. The end of the prequel trilogy. And I may or may not be doing it in Kermit's voice the entire time. Kermit, a.k.a. Kermit, the I can Senate. Try to do biggest. <laughs> <laughs> I can try to do biggest voice. So, first off, we haven't had Mr. Daniel on, on any of these Star Wars ones yet, so I'm super interested just quickly about like your passion for Star Wars and... Um, what kind of you thought of the prequel trilogy in general leading up to this movie? Wait, you want me to be quick about this? <laughs> <laughs> quick is a relative term from a certain point of view. <laughs> uh, let me see. Uh, so, so the prequel, prequel, ah, the prequel uh, trilogies uh, or trilogy. Um, yeah, no, uh, I was back when it came out, I was super excited for it. And uh, then that, and uh, I'm gonna laugh at it. And then, um, I then as, as we got to watch it, as we got to see it, um, I don't know, my, my brain just like died. <laughs> it's Austin's fault. I can't stop. <laughs> like, <any day. laughs> oh man, no, uh, as, <laughs> Uh, no one uh, so yeah no I, so uh i loved watching the movies yeah. I, lo- I loved uh, i loved the introduction of uh, the characters um stuff like some of them that were never in the uh the initial uh the initial thrill there's so many there's so many good ones to pick from isn't there I I talk about them. yeah yeah, like yeah, yeah. I, I could go on for days about how many great characters came out of the prequel trilogies and like especially with the expanded stuff we've gotten, just how good it's all been. Um, so great, welcome. I'm so glad you're here to talk Star Wars. This is kind of what we want to do in general, folks, is we want to like spread the different panelists who come on to these different things. Like if there's something you're really interested in and you want to uh, come on and talk about it or whatever, uh, or if you know, if you want to revisit something, I mean there's no uh shortage of things to talk about in all these movies so get at us if that's something that you're interested in uh otherwise let's go to henry and start us off henry since you are like the prequel like the bane of the prequels when it comes to like you all merely adopted the prequels i was born in it molded by it i know a slender man (laughs) what are your (laughs) Hasn't been asked yet. What is your what are your thoughts on the Battle of Coruscant? Um I think Bora, Mat. No, sorry. Oh, no, this I one was drums. It, it's like Yeah, dun, you know. Dun, 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 dun. I have to say, like, the the fight at the very beginning 
over Coruscant. It's like they took what was already established in Attack of the Clones and a little bit at the end of the Battle of Naboo and Phantom Menace, and they built upon that. And even though the Battle of Geonosis, as we discussed in the Attack of the Clones episode, was really, really awesome, this, I think, was the best in terms of the CGI graphics, the best in terms of battle tactics, the amount of battle droids, just the amount of craziness. Like You pause it at any given moment, and you see just the massive amount of work that was put in each and every shot with like ships in the backgrounds to the different droids that were flying around to just how they were all interacting with each other. And also like just the visuals, like I think that set a standard for what we eventually got in Clone Wars, the TV can, show, but also... Can I the, put in real quick? It's probably, yes. in my opinion, the probably tied for the second best space battle in any movie of Star Wars that we've gotten. Like... I think of the first Death Star Trench run in A New Hope is the best still, but mm. the fight, the Battle of Endor and the Battle of Coruscant are like pretty much tied based on how great they were. So that speaks to how good of an intro this was. Yeah, and I'd say like definitely in terms of epicness and what was on the line, like the battles for the Death Stars from the original trilogy are like god tier in terms of the significance. But I definitely think like in terms of like feeling. Like you're in this overwhelming battle. Um, I don't know if you guys have listened to it in 4K, but listening to this battle is insane. It is. It's like when you finally get to watch like the ride of the Rohirrim on a flat screen. It's just like it's completely amazing, and I think it really set in tone what the big deal about the Clone Wars actually was. Um, I won't go into the part where like they actually get on the ship and the whole stuff with Count Dooku because I'm sure we'll get into that later. Yeah, I mean it's. I'm going to toss this to uh, you know let's let's go back to Daniel real quick and give you another uh, chance at one of these. <laughs> you, here you get two Jedi in their prime. We're introduced to like you know, basically in essence they don't have the same uniform as in the Clone Wars show, but they are basically General Skywalker and General Kenobi both. Jedi Knights want a Jedi Master at this point, and just like go into town on these battle droids and into the I don't think it's called the Malevolence at that point, but that the main Grievous's main uh, battleship. What are your thoughts of this whole opening sequence? Oh, where they're just uh, slaughtering uh, droids left and right. Yeah, R two D two is like a hitman out for. Oh yeah, even R two D two's getting it, getting it on the uh, getting on the action. Um, but yeah, no, uh, when, yeah, no, they, well, they, they, uh, knew exactly what they, they knew exactly what they were there to do. They, uh, they, they showed up, they, uh, they kicked some battle droid ass. Of course, then they got caught by Ray, Shield, Ray Shields later, but, um. We're smarter than this. <laughs> it's like, we're smarter. Probably not. Uh, yeah, no, they had, to, um, yeah, no, and they, uh, they'd have, um, did Archer D2 get them out of that one or was the ship like so battered that it just failed? Like I, I um, I'm well, they like, eventually crash landed it onto Coruscant at the very end. It did break apart and stuff, but <laughs> they all made it off. Oh yeah, um, but yeah, no, uh, they were just, uh, but yeah, no, they had, well, they had a lot of experience killing the balance beforehand. And they were just going to town uh, on um, on making their way all the way to uh, the bridge. Um, they're like, I don't know how they really expected to stop them. I guess the the racial thing, but. Like, Very consequential, uh, you know, duel happening on that bridge, of course. Oh, Can't yeah, like over rematch that. of the century. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah, no, and, uh, yeah, rematch, they, they still, they still almost, um, they still almost bit it during that, during that rematch, too. Like, uh, yeah. like, Dooku is no small opponent, <laughs> like, despite being older than both of them. Um, he had like Anakin had only just passed him because they fought each other several times during the Clone Wars show. So like, it, it's it's not just Attack of the Clones and then now like there's been other encounters and stuff and he still failed. So yeah, Dooku was no slouch by any means. Um, yeah, yeah, no. Well, um, Anakin just just barely managed to get him. Um, you know, Obi Wan's you know on the ground at this point. Like I think he's trapped under uh, some debris. Yeah, again. Hey, fucking force pushes him like no problem. I was talking about this, Henry. I was like, there's got to be some kind of defense against force push. If someone does it, the other person is, they're fucking flying. It's like, 
Well, I was like, wondering too, like what? that thing like crushed his legs and he just kind of got up afterwards. And it's like, wouldn't that thing have broken your knees off or something? Like well, it's also funny yeah. that um, at least it's Morris. also funny that the force pushes are mentioned because like this scene specifically, I think gets overlooked when it comes to like later Star Wars movies, because the more time that goes on, it's insane how they've broken down the whole scene. Like, for example, every time that Count Dooku breaks through what is referred to as Jedi shield, the force shield, which is why most Jedi aren't supposed to be able to choke other Jedi unless they're like the power levels are like incredibly much higher. Um, every time they count Dooku breaks through it, they do a close up on Palpatine and they do it twice. So the speculation is that Palpatine is the one breaking through the force shield so that he can see Anakin versus Dooku. And that's basically him calculating what his next move is going to be. Is he going to use the separatists if Count Dooku wins the control of the galaxy, or is he going to use Anakin to use the Republic to take over the galaxy? And that was just how he was scheming it out. But also just all the other foreshadowing that George does in this scene, like, for example, um, where uh, Palpatine says, leave him or we'll never make it. And then he goes, well, his fate's going to be the same as ours. Anakin, Obi-Wan and Palpatine all die on the Death Star. So their fate all was the same. (laughs) Well, allegedly, until the damned sequel trilogy, but yeah, that's neither here nor there. Uh, I just yeah, keep we, my mouth uh, a little bit. Let's not talk about it. <laughs> so, I, uh, I, heard a, I heard a rumor that the sequel trilogy is going away. Is, is that no, a... It's, it's just, don't believe if all they that do the right thing. If they do the right thing, they will. But we'll like, find out. I, I'm good, really hoping good. Disney just uncanonizes it and it's like, yeah. <laughs> I'll be fine with that. Disney did it once, they can do it again. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. (laughs) The only way that happens is if they go full multiverse. I think they made and spent too much money on that sequel trilogy, so I don't think the business, unfortunately, for some who might like it to go, lines up. But I'm. I think that's the thing about Star Wars, though. It's so much more in the business. And as Heath Ledger once said, it's not about the money. (laughs) It's about sending a message. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I feel like you took that line from Fast and Furious, too. Could have. (laughs) We're gonna burn it. Well, anyways, yeah. getting back to the original to topic. Bo, hello there. Hi. Hmm. Hi. Right, what are your so, thoughts yeah. of the battle of Coruscant, man? It, it's awesome. I feel like I wish it was longer, honestly, but um, it, I mean, like I just took it all in, especially when they fly right over that opening and they just, you just see the whole thing just opens up. You're like, you're like oh, the oh, Fenitor class Star <clears throat> Destroyer. They kind of like parallel and then they turn and it's just like battle. And then the Yep, yep, and then the sound just drops, and it's just, it was just awesome to see. I mean, we got like a small glimpse of that, and um, it's some you know, Jedi Starfighter action. Yeah. yeah, what's find out how useless Astro Droids are. What's <clears> crazy <throat> is that like that, that, too. Or, that original cut of the movie was apparently four hours long, and the entire battle of Coruscant was allegedly like an hour, an hours long of an hour's worth. Excuse say. me, of the movie. I would have been so down for that, that. and Where hopefully, that, find this? I don't know. It would be amazing if Disney one day cut. I don't know. let it go. Yeah. <laughs> Release well, uh, the Lucas cut. Austin, what about you, man? How did uh, how did this first uh, scene sort of play for you, man? You know, being there at the midnight release of this movie, seeing it in theater, um, it was absolutely fantastic. Like, I can't say enough good things about just the opening scene. And when I say the opening scene, I basically mean from, like, until they land back on Coruscant. It's just because you know, like, they've really upped the ante. They've upped the stakes in this movie. Not just with, like, the visualization of the world and the action that's going on around. But it's just, like, everything seems to be a little more intense this go around. And mm-hmm. I think the Battle of Coruscant makes up for, like, don't get me wrong i i like the first two movies but like it totally makes up for at least attack of the clones being like an entire slog of like a second act of a movie and if they had to like do all the exposition there to kind of allow for this to happen maybe right but like in this one we're going in it's like a three-year period in between the two and like it's just been like an all-out war in between and especially if you haven't seen the clone wars which i haven't it's just like you are thrown right into the middle of everything. And I guess in the Clone Wars sake, the tail end of everything. Well, yeah, right? the, the Clone Wars pretty much. Movie. Yeah, you're right. The, the Clone Wars pretty much goes from like right after Attack of the Clones to like within a couple of days of the end of this movie. Because like the last season, the last four episodes at the Siege of Mandalore 
line up directly with the Battle of Coruscant and Anakin's turn. And so Ahsoka is going and fighting Maul on Mandalore. And meanwhile, they are both sensing something's wrong. And like Obi-Wan, like Ahsoka in that show, and I don't want to spoil anything for anybody, she like pops up in a lot of the scenes that like take place throughout this movie. Like when they're in like a meeting or a huddle or something, they've all got the holograms on. She was either like, she was on that called just before or just after for some of them. So anyways. Yeah. I like long, how I tie that in. Yeah, it's you, pretty sweet. Yeah. Long story. But yeah, no, I mean, for you not having seen all that kind of stuff, um, you know, like I'm sure. And for me too, cause I, that stuff didn't even exist the first time I saw it. So. Um, right. And it's just, like I said, going into this movie, you just know everything is going to be so much better. And like specifically for me, it's just like I had such a problem with the uh, Obi-Wan Anakin versus Dooku fight in episode two. And this one, again, just up the stakes, up the ante. And we got such a good lightsaber duel with Dooku, finally, at least, you know, as far as the films go. Yeah. Um, and Henry, you mentioned uh, foreshadowing. And like, I actually on this uh, rewatch, I picked up on a couple of, Oh, they're not mm-hmm. really foreshadowing, but they are callbacks to other movies. And um, one line that always stuck with me in A New Hope, I have it written down here, where Obi-Wan is talking about Anakin to Luke in A New Hope. He says, the best star pilot in the galaxy and a cunning warrior. And like this scene alone, especially when they're flying towards Grievous' ship, like that is that line. Like that entire scene is Obi-Wan describing, reciting that line. And also, I picked up on this one as well. There's a callback to the Phantom Menace when Qui-Gon and um, Obi-Wan are fighting the two destroyer droids in the hallway, the droidicos. And like, they totally have the scene. They totally have a scene where they're trying to break into the elevator and it's just like destroyers. And just like that happened in episode one. (laughs) (laughs) But those are just two little things I picked up on. It was really cool. Nice. It really goes to show how much Obi Wan really respects Anakin. Like how they, well, and Anakin respects Obi Wan as well. They're such a good unit, and their banter, I think, is much better and flows much more naturally in this movie. Mm-hmm. So, again, everything is just top notch in just this entire like was like half hour worth of the movie. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with pretty much all the points that were just made, and like the two biggest being like this is kind of crazy to see, you know. Anakin has matured quite a bit between an um, attack of clones and this, uh, whether you follow the, you know, couple years of canon material that's available or not. I mean, three years in the clone wars will change anybody and probably made a lot of people grow up a lot faster than they would have, especially somebody like Anakin. So it's really cool. Like you start, it's got all the great, like all these shots of, you know, you're following along with the Jedi starfighters and they're just kind of weaving in, and out of things you see like a you know a galactic republic era uh like the precursor to the x-wing um all just all sorts of awesome you know venator class star destroyers fighting the separatist war vessels and stuff like that and then so you get all this awesome imagery all this cool stuff going on and then you get like the most one of the most consequential moments in all of star wars which is pretty much the duel to see who gets to be sidious's next apprentice is it going to be Count Dooku still, or is it going to be Darth Vader? And you just, you, you don't really, you kind of, you know it's happening because you the original trilogy already obviously existed. So people, um, you know, knew that he was going to be Darth Vader, but this is where you're like, oh crap. So he killed off his apprentice and now he's like got his eye on you sort of thing. <laughs> so Do you that- think uh, he told Dooku to throw that fight? Oh no. no, Dooku looked, no. Well, no, Dooku looked really afraid. surprised when Palpatine's like, kill him. And, you know, both <laughs> Dooku and Anakin look at Palpatine like, what? <laughs> no, but I'm saying, I think he, I, I feel like he's like, let him defeat you or something. I don't know. No, like, no, no, no. Just, feel like... just because of the look on his face. And he, Christopher Lee sold it so well. He was like, legitimately, like, wide eyed, like, oh my God. Because he's like, kill him now. <laughs> Yeah, but he's but he's like uh, I don't know, man. I just feel because he just took out Obi Wan just like nothing. He could have forced pushed Anakin did the same thing. And, and I, I don't uh, want to get too stuck it. in the mud and mire of like canon via Clone Wars because it's it's kind of hard not to at times. And I, I apologize, it's just a blanket apology because it's going to happen throughout the episode. But oh yeah, um, Dooku failed Sidious fight. many times. There's a whole like five arc um, comic <laughs> called uh, Darth Maul, Son of Dathomir, where like. Darth Maul captures Count Dooku and takes him to Dathomir 
and it takes Sidious, General Grievous, and Count Dooku to like legit summon Darth Maul's mom back and then murder her again. And so there were several instances like that where Count Dooku failed Darth Sidious, and he had been like grooming all sorts of other apprentices for years. I I guarantee it. So mm. he was because that's the dart the the Sith kind of credos is they're always looking for it to, to kill their master and then to find like their apprentice kind of thing. Cause the rule of two. Yeah. So. Darth Bane's rule of two or is Darth Bane canon at all? Or was he that might as, he, he might was in Clone Wars? So I would say, yes. I was going to say he might as well be because his rule still, you know, his rule still applies. It persists. My powers um, have doubled since the last time we met. I guess they did. All right. Mr. Doubled. So how did you like the pregnancy arc of Anakin and Padme's relationship? No, uh, no fire in this one, oh, my friend. Prayers. Just full on bun in the oven <laughs> from the get go. Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, we knew it was going to happen, um, and uh, I, you know, I was fine with it. Mm-hmm. I mean, it wasn't anything crazy for me. It was just like, okay, I mean, we knew she's going to have, you know, kids and twins, and there was definitely no third. So. Oh, that would have been cool. Maybe like a like she actually had triplets. They're the third one. No, but that but there's <laughs> there was only two. So uh, that was just kind of it wasn't anything crazy for me. Um, I just you know, but it I just happens. Could happen. Well, yeah. Austin, what about you, man? How uh, did you enjoy this part of the film this time? I know <clears throat> me and you were a little bit more sour on kind of the what do we call I, I, it? I, I, the, I know uh, the love, just the love story, the dialogue, just everything about kind of Anakin like and Padme's ex- relationship in Episode Two. <laughs> yeah, the execution of it and stuff like that, as opposed to uh, like this one, where it's I don't know, wasn't well, wasn't quite as let, like cringy or anything. Yeah, I'll say this: I didn't like the execution of it in Episode Two, but like I said, I appreciate it from a storytelling perspective, like. Yeah. like this needs to happen. You know, we have to give Anakin, you know, motivation to, you know, want this power and to seek out help in this case from, you know, Darth Sidious or in his mind at the time, Palpatine. And you're, you said it, I think just a minute ago where this is a little more natural. I think the screenplay or the script is written better in this one. And I mm-hmm. think the acting the execution is better. Not every scene or every line really sticks the landing. In my opinion, you know, Anakin does kind of deliver some kind of like, just kind of stale, like you're so beautiful. And it's like, haven't you said this before or something like, don't we already know how you feel about her? Well, I will, I will partially butt in and just to say that I, on this watch specifically, I listened to every single piece of dialogue and I got to say, this one, I never really paid that close attention to it because at, at, at like first sight, you're just like, ah, Anakin and Padme, boring, ah. But I sat there and I listened to it this time and really like tried to focus in on everything that was being said. And in that moment that you're talking about where he's like, I just, I love you, you're so beautiful. He was kind of deflecting from the fact that she was prodding him, trying to figure out what's going on, why he's unsettled. And he's like trying not to tell her that, oh, I dreamed about you dying the way I dreamt about my mom dying before she was slaughtered by sand people. And so he's like, I love you. You're so beautiful. (laughs) um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, not to to take away from your point. (laughs) No, no, no. You're you're absolutely right, though. And um, I I also like really paid attention to dialogue. And like Mm -hmm. I heard lines that I had never heard before. And one of them, which kind of, I guess, just always, you know, went one ear and out the other for me. Uh, it's not a direct quote, but from like one of the very first scenes um, with Anakin and Padme together, that's not the initial like landing where he joins all the politicians. There's a line where Padme is like, when are we going to start being honest with each other? And that's, it, it kind of is a throwaway line, but like, you know, if you're, if you're like me and like have to think so hypercritically about all this, um, it just goes to show where it's like, is this relationship actually working? Was it ever meant to work from the start? Was it always kind of meant to be kind of wishy-washy back and forth? Uh, I I definitely think it was kind of like set up to fail from the beginning simply because he was a Jedi and Jedi training. So the second they pulled the trigger on it, it was like, 
well, like <laughs> you can't really tell anybody or else you're going to be excluded from the Jedi Order. And probably that tends to drive some people to the dark side. More often than not, they don't just become Ahsoka like Grey Jedi. They just right. straight up go and, full on dark side. And, and uh, even like just relating it back to Attack of the Clones where Padme in you know, Bo's favorite scene with the fireplace where uh, <laughs> uh, Padme's like, we, we we can't do this because it would destroy both of our lives. You know, it was and hot in this there. is this is that Padme line. showing Anakin her Al Green records. <laughs> it was eighty-seven degrees in that mall room. Gonna make uh, love. Yeah, to this you. episode three is like that line coming back to like haunt them essentially. Yeah, but, you and know, there's it, a ton of foresight too in what they say in this movie, like much more so than the last one. I thought that like listening to some of it talk about like like you can tell Anakin's just like, ah, but the Jedi, oh, but they seem corrupt. Oh, they, and she's always like, What are you talking about? They don't seem corrupt at all. It's just I, I, I've been losing my body. <laughs> losing it. What? Well, there, there's Why don't so, you just talk there's to so many people there's so many people like trying to get into Anakin's head and like persuade him to like think one way so he can't really think for himself anymore. Which again, like, leads to his eventual turn to the dark side because he doesn't. The Jedi really trust are evil, him. and the only person he ends up trusting is, you know, Palpatine. Well, I'm going to toss it to uh, Henry now, but before I do, it's like the only thing about the whole Padme Anakin relationship that bugs me really at this point is that at the oh end my. of Attack of the Clones, when they are done fighting and Yoda saves them and all that. She comes in and just like straight up starts macking on Anakin and Yoda and Obi-Wan are sitting there like staring right at them. So are they like, oh, she's mysteriously pregnant now? Oh, Anakin does like all these rando side trips and like he catches him lots of times, like calling Padme and stuff. It's just like, like who's the daddy? <laughs> oh, uh... the Jedi are kind of to blame for this whole Darth Vader uprising problem, aren't they? I mean, like they, especially by the time uh, Anakin goes to Yoda is talking like he said like, premonitions. <laughs> Where's the daddy? <laughs> I don't know. Take take it from somewhere in there. Like, what are your what are your feelings? I'm I'm sure you're a lot more uh, in tune with uh, you know their relationship than I am. Are you talking to me? Correct. <laughs> so, um, but this movie specifically being my favorite Star Wars movie of all time. Like, of course, I've all the points I've just made. Like, I've I've been dissecting and of course, like we're all friends, as I said in the last video as well. Uh, I do think that the relationship was played exactly as it was supposed to be. Um, but one thing I think that would have helped, especially with the watches is there are deleted scenes um, that focus mainly on Padme speaking with Mon Mothma and Bail Organa and all of them kind of formulating what becomes the rebel Alliance and the symbolism that is there. And I think that symbolism was in the back of George's head. Every time you have seen Anakin and Padme on one, one on each side and the things that they say, like they did it in Attack of the Clones when they talked about like the authoritarian like dictatorship versus democracy with Anakin kind of being pro that and then her being pro democracy, then them kind of just laughing it off when in reality, that's a huge foreshadowing to this guy's going to birth the empire and this girl in a way, is going to birth the Rebel Alliance through her meetings with Bail Organa and Mon Mothma. And then, of course, the um, I heard somebody say about like, Spencer about like um, Anakin and just kind of how like he's like, oh, well, are the Jedi corrupt? Are the Jedi evil? And this just goes back to because I, I know this is one of the questions I didn't want to get too far ahead of myself, but like just Palpatine scheming and how he just how good he was at playing him. And I think those deleted scenes in episode three were, should have been in there. I wish there was an issue where they actually placed it into the film where they bring their case in front of Palpatine and she's on one side, but behind him is Anakin and he's basically gripping his lightsaber. And they even say it again, where he's like, I don't know what, what's happening to the Republic because of the war and everything. She goes, well, have you ever considered we're on the wrong side? And he immediately turns around and is like you're sounding like a separatist and in that moment i'm like that is darth vader he is just the he'd, empire he'd been the radical, republic yeah he'd been radicalized at this point <laughs> yeah and like i think so it's just i feel like those deleted scenes should have been in there to flesh out like this crazy dynamic that they have between each other 
But as for the relationship itself and specifically the pregnancy, which is what I think the question was about, like, I think I remember seeing it and I didn't know it was just going to be something where she was going to be like, oh, yeah, I'm pregnant because we all knew it was going to happen. But of course, when we're seeing this movie, our minds aren't necessarily on that, even though, of course, like, oh, Princess Leia, Luke Skywalker, our favorite heroes, plus Han Solo. But that's a different story. Um, the significance of what they mean for the franchise, because, of course, Luke's the one who turns it back to the good side. But I think because of the amount of information we had to process that it kind of had to be sidelined. I will say, though, I think Natalie Portman did an excellent job of like in the first two films where she's first, she's a young rising politician. And then the second one, she's like full on like revolutionist, like a uh, fighter kind of because she she believes in democracy. She believes in the republic. She doesn't believe in all these ideas that separatists are are proposing especially with like count who before the war even breaks out but then in this movie like she starts questioning things not only in the senate but also she starts questioning the role as a person she becomes a little more stressed um she becomes a mother and she's just like i just i can't protect the galaxy i have to protect my kids now and i need anakin's help to do that and i think that just digs an even deeper toll when obi-wan's telling her like you know he he killed kids like he's serving the self-proclaimed emperor now and she's just like she's a lot of people have gotten her on natalie portman for these scenes where she's just kind of like breathing heavily and she's just like just imagine all the things that she's going through at that point where she's had to keep the relationship secret you know well they could have done some of those parts better in the movie but well there was a war going on so it wasn't like they weren't distracted um also a reason why palpatine's a genius because he knew it was going on that everybody else didn't because he it's like a magic trick when something's happening over here there's really something happening over here the prestige Um, yeah but the question is sorry i i just thought about this this is kind of weird but i mean the kids grow fast in this film like like she she told him he was she was pregnant with had time go gone by like i mean it takes what like nine months but to she, have a kid right? she could have been like three months in and like maybe not showing up but she also wore those baggy like dress things because when she's on the ledge where he has that scene where he's like you're so beautiful she's kind of showing but they don't go too far down the ways but like even when she's hmm. walking around she's like the baby it's like you can see something's there so i would assume she's like three three and a half months by that point maybe further we haven't so seen her in quite a while. I remember, out. he was like, said the line about like, oh, if, you know, he had never come to Coruscant, I would have never gotten the opportunity to come here. And that was another so, that was another important line too that I think gets overlooked, where he whispers to Padme, he's like, if the Chancellor hadn't been uh, abducted, they wouldn't have called him back from the Outer Rim sieges. So I think all of it was planned by Palpatine. Like I think Palpatine knew that Anakin was powerful enough to defeat. Dooku, I think he knew that his wife was pregnant. I think I also think that he knew that these visions were going to start coming because Anakin told him about his visions. He I thought Austin fell, dude. I thought he fell down. You're good. I just <laughs> got a message. Sorry. <laughs> well, so uh, yeah, that's like... bas- that's basically why. Like, I think all those those what like as a kid, of course, I just wanted to see like you know the Jedi find the Sith and all that stuff. But it's just like now watching it. Is- I'm like all of those lines this is just how brilliant george lucas is like all of those lines mean something also going into my dislike of the sequel trilogy where they just use lines and had absolutely no idea what they meant but that's a conversation for a different story for a different time and you bring up some good points one of which is the um the deleted scenes there is a scene um a deleted scene where uh shock t is killed master shock t gets killed by yep. grievous who was mm-hmm. she was sent to protect palpatine and in the like one of the last episodes of clone wars ahsoka gets the message from obi-wan she's like oh can i talk to anakin and he's like oh no i'm sorry he you know we're getting prepared to go um master shock t is going to protect the emperor and i don't know all this stuff and it's, it's just so crazy to see how like but then she got murdered so one of her lightsabers was in Grievous' stash, but that's something that nobody saw. So, you know, it would have been more. Well, didn't like, they bring Shakti back in uh, Force Unleashed? Shakti, Shakti. Not Force that I know Unleashed? of. No. Mm. I remember seeing her. There was a Jedi that looked like Shakti that you fight. Well, she's her own race. Like, yeah, the Tagroot. She's the uh, same okay. as Ahsoka, actually. Yeah. But, um, 
anyways so yeah that was kind of cool but uh daniel what um what do you think about this relationship and i have an interesting question for you do you think palpatine uh put these nightmares in um anakin's head at all do you think it's possible so I actually looked that up uh, before uh, before signing on today um, because I was wondering like how far Palpatine had thought back, you know, how far his planning went. And I'm like, did he was he the one putting the nightmares in uh, in Anakin's head? And, well, uh, and I'll cut you off real quick just to say that, like, so in the rise of Skywalker, the giant dumpster fire that it is, <laughs> it um it does kind of play in talk about how he allegedly as far as i understand it because that movie is like logic is all over the place but allegedly what i understand it is he used or had the power to kind of influence ray and kylo and kind of bridge that link in addition to kind of manipulating snoke as kind of this like quasi puppet thing over here um so it made me wonder in hindsight i was like well was he like to talking about his plan was that part of his plan too like because he might have the power of foresight does anakin really have the power of foresight or is he just planting images in his head to really fuck with him so i had that question too and i actually looked it up and um what i found suggests that uh palpatine in fact did not have um the foresight ability um Mm -hmm. and and didn't put the did not put the uh the visions inside uh, anakin's head he did however bug An- Anakin and Padme's room and uh, was uh, was told about the visions because of that. <laughs> oh. And he, kind of just pl- and he just played into it. Like... That's one aspect I never thought of. It's like the legitimate, like, just the, the I guess, as far as Jedi and Sith are concerned, low tech, but putting cameras and <laughs> sound bugs and stuff and things. Yeah. Like, he had that sort of power. Oh, Sounds yeah, no, pretty he, kinky. He definitely used his power <laughs> for, for a guy named Steve. He, he definitely <laughs> used like you know just re- he he used like you know just regular spy tactics basically to figure out a lot of the, a lot of the stuff that he knew. And I gave uh, him a huge leg up on people. I'm sure he had Coruscant just bugged all over. <laughs> oh yeah, no, um, but but yeah, no. So so the so I guess the the. The uh, canical, mechanical answer to your uh, question is he didn't plan all of that. He just saw it happening and then worked he his plans around it. Exacerbated so, the situation. Yeah, which is which is a, which is another skill set in itself. It's like another reason why Palpatine is so dangerous. Oh yeah, <laughs> throughout has, all with of that it. ability to just adapt to any situation as we've seen throughout the first three films and yeah there's like speculating and stuff like that but i think he's kind of like i guess the best comparison is batman where it's like he has backup plans for having backup plans for having backup plans where it's like okay if this guy fails then i'm gonna take this person and just like oh here's this little kid jedi who happens to be really powerful with the force i'm gonna start being a father figure to him in case this other guy who used to be on the jedi council fails me he's just like he kind of has all these pieces in place that he can like choose and grab from wherever, wherever he has to. And I think that's, that's definitely why like he he's the most dangerous person the galaxy's ever seen. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, um, but yeah, bar none. <laughs> like I can't even think of a more terrifying opponent. And the thing is he doesn't, he doesn't do a whole lot of fighting actually. He, I mean, he fights like Yoda. Well, um, I'm off. No, again, man, do my he, spinny move. When Darth yeah. Maul gets yeah. too powerful, he literally <laughs> goes and fights Darth Maul and Se- uh, oh, Savage and, Brass and, uh, and kills Savage. Oh yeah, like he. Oh yeah, he. Do, I mean, he does a little bit of fighting in the uh, in the Clone Wars, and um, <laughs> and he does. He does, of course. Rival. You know, he does, of course, take out how many Jedi Masters do you take out? Like three under them. Three. Three. Before and they then... even had time to react. Okay, so he's so yeah. I'm not I was like, <laughs> yeah, no, like, um, and they and these are like giant and masters, not. I'll tell you why. When that motherfucker jumped up, <laughs> that bleh, I would have been like, what the? Fuck? Yeah, no, I would have done like, the same thing. He, he like, went like total. Um, he went total Kermit. He was like Bilbo with, like, the ring. Oh, he did a barrel roll. That's what he. <laughs> Did with a lightsaber. So well, the, sure. The, left click. Left click. Dude. The, the immediate counter for that would have been for all four of them to just to point their lightsabers straight out, and he would have been like, "What?" Like <laughs> pike formation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we have to say Obi Wan was if Obi Wan was there, he would have sliced him in half. Like, oh yeah. Obi Wan would have been alright. Like, I have to take a moment and just like 
I guess, just glorify that moment in the cinema. Because when I saw this in 2005, or when we all saw it, it's just like, it's one of those things where I, Ian McDermott even said it in his interview. It's like, you have this rough idea of what's going to happen the first time you see it, but then you have no idea what's going to happen. And when he pulled out a lightsaber, I did not see that coming. And it was just one of those moments where it's like, this is about to go down. It's and treason then. The fact that he bested three masters, as you just said, but then also, like, and this is the more nerdy side, but mastered uh, form. I can't remember which form. It's the form that Yoda mastered, mm-hmm. and there's only two uh, Jedi uh, in Teru? the movie. I think it's form, form six. It's form five, I thought. I forget. Might be form five. Mm-hmm. But yeah, like the fact that only two Force masters uh, had ever demonstrated in the movies and it was yoda and sidious and that's it no one else ever came close to them in terms of that i think anakin would have been more powerful than the emperor because he even says it in the movie and i think technically he does when he's vader but i mean that's a discussion for another time well here's a good here's a good point to pivot real quick before we get too deep in anything and i'm sorry i'll let you fit do you want to finish your point and then i'll pivot i'm sorry i totally (laughs) broke you (laughs) No, it's just like that scene in general, which is just like, you know, when, when we talk about like these movies, I feel like Palpatine in general, like when I hear people talk about the prequels, especially like I feel like Palpatine is a character that a lot of people kind of breeze over very easily. But it's like he is Star Wars. He's the reason these six movies happened in the first place. He is, he is the sense. ultimate antagonist, no doubt. Austin, I want to kind of transform this discussion into what are your overall thoughts of Darth Sidious's plan to convert Anakin and how that all went down? Like, just it's it's pretty much the entire movie at this point. But sure. Go You're for it. You're absolutely right. Do I have notes? Let me check my <laughs> notes. <laughs> oh, again, you mentioned paying attention to the dialogue. And like, this is, again, when I started really paying attention, again, another line that I never picked up on is when they're in that, um, they're in that theater. And I guess we're watching, I don't, I don't really know what it is we're watching. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, I don't think anyone really knows what we're watching in that room. <laughs> anyway, the scene with the Darth Plagueis scene. Um he says this line i'd be worried about the collective wisdom of the council if they didn't select you for this assignment you're the best choice by far so palpatine and i kind of alluded to it earlier is like at the end of the day the one guy that anakin ends up trusting by the end of this movie and he's just feeding anakin everything he wants to hear while everyone else in his life is just like you know angering him and like you know, trying to manipulate him. So like, you are going to be our puppet to do this against your friend or your mentor, in this case, Palpatine. And Anakin's like, you're asking me to do something that's against the Jedi code and like against a mentor and a friend. So you can see throughout this movie, he's just winning him over. Palpatine is because, you know, what is it? I think it's episode two where he says it, where it's like, you're the most gifted Jedi I've ever met. So like yep. even as far back as that, you see him. I mean, even episode one, we'll watch your career with great interest. I don't think at that point, at least in episode one, that Palpatine really has the plan because I you cannot argue that the plan was to get Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan on Tatooine to find Anakin. Like don't argue that because you're wrong. So yeah, I have a hard time believing that. <laughs> but when it gets to episode three, like again, the first half of this movie at least when we get to cars i'm just meeting him and like feeding him all this like positive reinforcement that he wants you know from the jedi right but he's it, giving it to anakin's him personally kind of, anakin's kind of like a labrador retriever it's like if they just kept giving him treats yeah he'd follow him around so that's kind of what emperor palpatine does he's or senator at the time chancellor chancellor palpatine chancellor. Chancellor. god damn he's had a lot of roles but um, he's just like He's just giving him these like Scooby snacks, just like, oh man, he's you're crazy. And then like calling all the shots as well at the same time. He was just like, Oh, well, yeah, you have to kill him because it's it's you know, he he's too dangerous to be left alive, wink wink. And then like he's oh, they're crazy. They, they're not gonna let you be a master. Oh, that's ridiculous. And then it like kind of like the tipping point is like they told you to spy on me, didn't they? Blah blah blah. And Anakin's like, oh, Yup. <laughs> they totally <laughs> falls for it. But it's he's, the hidden cameras. Here's something, Bo, I'm going to toss this to you now. Here's something that just occurred to me listening to Austin speak on it. Like, Anakin kills Count Dooku and immediately is like, for the first time, kind of like 
what am I doing? Like, he kind of does it with the Sand People massacre, but with this especially, he's like, I had him dead to rights. He was zero threat. And and then he still kills him. And then he's like, the look on his face after he does it and all that. He knows what that the, done? he knows that the what Jedi can done? be he knows they can be the Jedi can be corrupt pretty much because he's corrupt. So it almost becomes this weird like self fulfilling prophecy, like all the stuff he's done. I know we're not talking Clone Wars, but I'm gonna keep talking about it. He kills a lot of people like indiscriminately in the Clone Wars animated show. Like a lot, a lot of people. He yeah. has no qualms about like the I forget his name, like General Tusk or something, but like the big spider general. And he threatens Padme at one point, like Padme's in some convoy and he threatens and Anakin just immediately takes off and goes and murders this dude. Cause he's like, you're a Jedi. You won't kill me. He's like, I am a Jedi and I will kill you. <laughs> so like he's, he's done a lot of this and like the Jedi never said no, but then like he gets to this point in the story and Palpatine's like, all right, I want him as my apprentice. And he starts rolling the dice and, Anyways, Bo, talk about your favorite impressions of, like, or I don't even know what I'm saying at this point. Talk about, like, their relationship and stuff and some of your favorite parts about it and just the plan in general. The relationship with uh, uh, Palpatine and Anakin? Yeah, man. Um, yeah, they, it's, like, I mean, you guys said it, man. He's been playing this dude and just feeding him and just, he's, he, he basically... You know, he got in. He got into this boy's uh, guts, man. Uh, he in his head, and um, and, uh, yeah, he just. I guess when he actually like turned it, it did seem kind of, kind of drastic. But it was just all building up to this moment, and it just, uh, yeah, just to yeah, it's just crazy just to see him. Just like I bow, you know, to you and whatever you want, and then he gives him a Darth name right there and it's just it's just, it just all building up to that moment and uh you know we all knew it was going to happen and and that's that's it's it's wild know. because like he and daniel i'm going to toss this to you next like anakin really like he he is a flawed character in so many ways but the real reason he really went with sidious on this was because Sidious was like i can help you with padme like i know about the dreams i can help you with padme and that in the end is what turned him i think so was his connection to her so do you think that all was a fact i mean clearly it worked out the way sidious wanted to but like just talk a little bit more about kind of like the plan as it unfolded and, and kind of your opinions of it the uh, the plan so the uh, the plan of um so after so after sidious found out about the visions um and knew that that's yeah, so so uh, Sidious found out about the visions he knew that that was like literally at the forefront of anakin's mind and uh, he knew that um, he knew that Anakin would do anything for Padme, uh, including the uh, turning his back on the Jedi Order, and he exploded the hell out of it. Um, and it it was like a it was scabby of, just kept pressing like yeah. If, if he, you kill me, you will not be able to save Padme. But together, pimple popper. <laughs> <laughs> he um yeah no like and it, this kind of literally this is this is the best thing that could have happened for uh, for Palpatine like this. Like this fell right into his lap. I let's see. I would have liked to have seen. Um, I would have liked to have seen. You know, some of his backup plans for it, though, because uh, I don't think. Um, let me see. I don't think uh, he really intended um, things to go as fast as they did initially. I think that he was going to drag it out a lot more as soon. But as soon as like he finds that he there's a weakness in Anakin's psyche that he can exploit. I think that at that point, that's when he kicks things off for the, um, you know, for the separatists to actually like fall. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, that's when he starts the uh, the fight between Anakin and Dooku. You know, it's like, all right, it's like, well, you're you're ready for harvest. Let's see, if, let's see what you got. Well, it's something that might not be touched on very much before I throw it to Henry is like, really, the by the point in the story where we get the Battle of Coruscant, the separatist alliance was pretty well decimated they lost they they won a lot of battles but they lost a ton so besides having you know the ability to like just throw endless amounts of droids at them i mean there weren't like a lot of great military minds left it was all the bureaucrats like newt gunray and watt tambor and all these people left so like palpatine needed to make a move off of them soon i would have assumed and who better than to you know anakin who he'd really like 
somebody else said a minute ago, like since episode one when he meets him. I did my waiting. Twelve years of it during the Clone Wars. <laughs> I, I can't start going off of quotes or else we'll be here for like 20 minutes. <laughs> Go ahead, Henry. What do you think of the plan and everything? I'm sure you've, uh, di- you know, dissected it quite a bit. Well, I think it was beautifully done. I think Ian McDiarmid is a brilliant actor. I mean, he embodies the character and this goes back to Tom Felton and Emma Watson, where it's like you have these actors that played this character too well. Like I, I saw your McDermott in another movie about Queen Elizabeth or another movie like Sleepy Hollow. It's like you're still the emperor. You're still Chief Palpatine. You can't break out. And like even then, it's just like you always think he's up to something. He's scheming. And also like in this part of the movie, like I think one thing that's clearly evident that like I think it's overlooked as well is that by this point, well, I don't know if he had any apprentices um, preceding Darth Maul, but at this point, he already had two that he already had for mil- You know, he had to convert them. So um, at this point, he's not only a master like at using the force, but he's his manipulation tactics are at an all time high. Like he wrote the book on it at this point, and it's just the level of intelligence that he has to demonstrate from everything with the way that he talks with people to the way that um, there's just so many different factions of him, specifically through the three prequel movies. And every time he's on screen, when I did this rewatch, it just becomes more and more apparent than things I didn't pick up on as a kid that every piece of dialogue he gives is so vitally important. We see it in episode one where he's literally whispering into uh, uh, Padme's ear what of course it's the decoy but he's whispering in her ear this is where he's going to lose his power this is what you have to do and he's getting people to do it and then even in the second one like it's he changes his character he on the forefront acts like he's less aggressive with what he wants and more democratic but and he's like well my negotiations won't fail please trust me in the back of his mind he's like okay we're going to start this war and he almost fools you like even watching it even though you know what happens in the original trilogy you know that's him he fools you and he does it so well um and i just think that just goes back to the hauntingly good conversation that dave filoni had about duel the fates it was all about anakin having a father figure and because qui-gon lost the duel the the scapegoat that had to pick it up was palpatine and it's i don't know just it's aged beautifully i think i think when it first came out there were just too many questions for people to handle all at once but as you know we're almost up to two decades since this movie came out four years from now it's been 20 years when we get to that point i think this movie just ages better and better and there's still after almost 20 years so much you can dissect from this relationship alone that's before you get to all the other stuff that's going on yeah, definitely. Um, I think we got everybody on that question, right? Did we have everybody? I think, I think so. So, all right. Yeah, it is like I just bring up another point. Uh, something that Henry said. It, like it's always those villains that kind of keep their composure throughout. Like every scene, they never really do lose their like sense of humanity until you know, like the scene with Mace Windu where we get the nine twenty, the nine hundred. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, SSX like, baby. Than, <laughs> is sick, bro. Other than that, they're like those are the building villains that are always threatening and intimidating. The ones where it's just like you're so good at just like <laughs> your it's really, composure. It's like, really like know? the devil just like whispering in his ear the whole time. Like Palpatine, especially after like his encounter with Mace there. Um Ooh. he's Ooh. much he's much more like what my envision like when I when I think about the devil, like the classic just amorphous character of the devil it's kind of like the emperor once he's scarred and deformed and everything like this old like creepy man kind of like walks like a tyrannosaurus rex and just like then we shall have peace it's like and you're just kind of like oh. bro bro you look creepy <laughs> as f- he looked creep yeah he looked really yeah. good in the uh the um the original um go get a fresco <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah. but um 
So anyways, Bo, I'm going to start this one off with you, sir. Hey. What did you think about one of my favorite characters from this that we got introduced to was General Grievous? What did you think about his design, his character, how he was used, and was he used effectively? Dude, honestly, <laughs> honestly, if I saw that dude, that I'll be one's a brave motherfucker because I would have. I've with all of those. Did you say blades, Bobby one? <laughs> oh, I'll say one, you fuck. Um, <laughs> but, Bobby on the room. Um, dude, man, I just. I mean, I just feel like yeah. I, he doesn't have any force powers, but I don't know, man. I just I feel like he could easily like destroy Jedi in general. I mean, he's got the lightsabers to prove it. But then again, I don't know, man. I question like Jedi that are their the skill levels because they, sometimes they just seem to go down too easy, and I, I that's I, that's what kind of makes me kind of mad. Well, they certainly do sometimes, but that kind of goes. They back need to, to invest in armor or something at least well, it does take years and years of training to get to like where the obi-wans and the anakins were but it's like several of the people that entered the clone wars were like kids younglings young padawans and like they just went out like that so unless, unless, you're a disney, unless you're a disney princess <laughs> <fucking right. laughs> <laughs> yeah like an attack Mary of the Sue. clones well, like an attack of the clones when yoda is talking to them and obi-wan's like he's so arrogant Yoda's like, yes, uh, trait all more common in young Jedi these days and stuff. And so, who had never been in a war in their entire lives. Oh, yeah. And then there's just like, I'm sure with the amount of Jedi who died in the Clone Wars, they had to like churn out a couple new recruits a little bit faster than they want to. And so, some of these, like, like I think of like Kit Fisto's apprentice who just became a Jedi Knight, ended up on a mission with uh, Kit Fisto. They actually ended up in General Grievous's lair and he kills Uh. Kit Fisto's apprentice who just become the knight it was even kane and jarvis was like a kid yeah and you saw what he grew up to be so it's like they are they, there's the ability to be powerful but like yeah i mean a lot of them like caleb doom when he was caleb doom he like had to hide for his life he was effed same thing with uh cal castus in fallen order but anyways going way off track here um yeah. daniel talk right. a little bit about um, um or sorry did you have anything else to say on it i'm sorry uh no i just I, other than that i just grievous i mean the fight was um it was okay i guess i i just i feel like he would have s- slaughtered obi-wan uh just because i feel like he's a pretty beast of a machine he's a fucking machine he tried to kick him and he hurt his leg he's like uh, oh my God. you know and well but that when he got his back to the, chest piece oh, open yeah the obi-wan in his prime i don't know that's a tough opponent for anybody <laughs> Yeah, seriously, dude. And I'm just saying, dude, I, I just think he's Grievous, Grievous is a hard motherfucker to beat. I just, I think he would have taken at least three Jedi to take him out. So, so you like the character um, design just, and everything and how he was used? Yeah, he's pretty sick. Yeah, it was, like if I saw that coming at me, I would <laughs> run, like, run. he was like legit. I would sick. probably die, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was. Yeah, <laughs> you need a halls, buddy. But yeah, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Forgot oh, to turn yeah. on his humidifier last night in his his bunk. <laughs> no dicks that I want. Does anybody have any sure. orange slices? Sure, but you don't want to buy some orange. <laughs> well, Daniel, what did you think of General? Grievous? Daniel got it. <laughs> so, <laughs> I got it. it was just, I was so my so I did. actually um he's one of the he's probably my favorite uh, new character that was introduced in uh, in the third movie. Yeah, and I was a little sad that he you know had died by the end of it, but I also I felt that his death was was warranted because you know he doesn't show up at all like any time from there. Um. They also, what everyone's talking about, uh, agreed to some uh, coughing and hacking and stuff. Uh, do you remember? Uh, so remember when they came out with that like Clone Wars animated series, like before the yep. third movie came out? Yeah, Tsunami, baby. I know what you're about. I know what you're about to say, but uh, go right ahead. Oh yeah, um, yeah, no, uh, Grievous. Uh, so the one of the reasons that Grievous is like in such bad sorts in the movie was actually from one of the last scenes of that, where Mace Windu is just like trying to crush Grievous. Trying to force crush Grievous and Grievous is like, oh shit, ah, get away. <laughs> and um, and yeah, and so Grievous is still fucked up from that, like from that experience, you know, all the way through the movie. Yeah. Jeez. So like he so normally Grievous is just, you know, big and powerful and not, you know, sickly. 
Well, and he must not have had time since the last time he was, uh, you know, in a battle to go back to his lair. And he, like, would, like, if his arm got hurt or something, they would, like, oh, yeah, yeah, like sew so <laughs> one back onto him. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I want to um, respond to that point real quick, Daniel. I'm so sorry. Um, that specific scene, like, the Force Crab, like, when I was listening to, like, the extended wars and, like, the rules of the Jedi, it's, like, a Force Crush is a dark side power that is a big no-no for everybody in the entire world. No, nah, no. Nah. Yep. And people were saying that about Luke and the Mandalorian when he crushes the droid. However, with droids, they're not living creatures, but also, like, with Mace Windu, he, who's known to go from Form 7 to Form 8, and that only difference there is the dark side. And, like, not only did he use it against Grievous, but he also used it against Palpatine. That was the only way he was able to win. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, yeah, oh, Mace Windu is, is, that's a whole nother. Oh, Mace Windu, whole... kind of like the Sorcerer Supreme to Doctor Strange in, in this universe instead. It's like, wait, you, you draw on the Dark Dimension? Yes. Oh, um, <laughs> yeah, no, uh. But no, I I love I loved uh, I love Grievous's character. I love how he's able to like you know beat he's able to beat uh, so many force users just using lightsabers. Okay, granted he has fucking four of them, but um, but still like that's all he uses is uh, is lightsaber technique. Um, okay, that and like his legs. I'm pretty sure he crushes Jedi with his legs a bunch of times. He does uh, not skip leg day. He's no, awful. he does not. <laughs> he's awfully squirrely. Obi-Wan he found can... out you know kind of what's that word where he can kind of contortion himself into all sorts of weird ways that are like certainly not you know what jedi train against most of the time it's like oh yeah no he uh no i i was i i, I love i loved him as a character i was so happy when he was in clone wars that that they that they gave me more of uh more of him in clone wars um like you know and even Okay, I can't mention Grievous without mentioning like his one greatest failure, and his one greatest failure isn't being you know shot with a uh, with a blaster and in, in, in the duel between him and uh, General Kenobi. No, it's it's even worse than that. Um, the time that he got beaten by the Gungan army. Oh yeah, <laughs> I remember I know exactly sitting what you're there talking about. laughing oh, my man. ass off. <laughs> you know, just watching him being carried away by the Gungans of all people. <laughs> it was too bad that show didn't come out before this movie because there would have been so much more stakes to it. But yeah, no, it was. It was yeah, awesome. no, but okay, I'm not going to go too too far into uh, into the Clone Wars uh, <laughs> series because I'm pretty sure eventually we'll have. A, I'm pretty sure eventually there's there's going to be an episode about that because there's just so much. Yeah, I, I am kind of rebels. I was going to say I'm kind of brainstorming the best ways to go about that. Probably season by season, but we'll have to we'll have to think about that. Or we could go like just quick like ten minute episodes. I don't know. We will figure <laughs> it out. But um, Austin, your yeah. thoughts on General Grievous and uh, all that stuff, yeah. So there are two categories of characters in my head. There are characters with limited amounts of screen time who are badass and those who aren't badass. General Grievous falls into the are badass category. And then the Fets are those who aren't. <laughs> but anyway <laughs> anyway because i had to throw respect, that in there <laughs> the shade. Um, i i'm really happy after watching the uh like behind the scenes footage of the designing of general grievous that that is the design they went with because there was like one option where like he was a kid he looked like this demonic little like baby like alien <laughs> thing and i'm just kind of like i'm so glad we got what we got <laughs> <laughs> what is that that's a Grievous. I am Grievous. Oh, sorry, Chucky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jesus. The, dreams. the lightsaber duel is cool. And like when you're first watching, like, all right, two lights. Oh, that's four lightsabers. There's like no way Obi-Wan's going to win. Of course, we know Obi-Wan is going to make even it flying out alive. When he started doing that. Well, it's like, like a, a small kid, too. I'm like thinking about when he starts like whipping him around and does like kind of the buzz saw maneuver towards him. I'm like, that's, that's what I want to perf- I was like, that's the perfect you know pose like how can you stop how can you defend against that and he goes every "Ah." every time every time my mom and i sit down (laughs) and watch this movie (laughs) seriously every time my mom and i watch this movie together she always has a problem with like how obi-wan doesn't die in this (laughs) (laughs) that's that's what i'm saying that's what i'm saying if he's blocking one hit he has three other arms that he can go you're dead 
Like that's what I'm saying. Block high, stab mid. Something. Seriously, yeah, he could Goro that shit. He could rip his arm I off mean, and slice him and Jesus. make sushi. I, but Goro also I, lost to Johnny Cage. Let's not forget. Mm, the Linda Nash beat Johnny Cage. <laughs> I mean, Johnny Cage beat Scorpion. So I mean, <laughs> Austin. The only reason I would think that Obi Wan probably did win, just bringing it back to because he's point. a cocky son of a bitch. <laughs> well, well, <laughs> he he's certainly his sass level is unparalleled, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> No, I think about just the fact, like, like they talk about, like, Grievous being this, he used to be this, like, crazy, amazing, you know, warrior for this, I'm not even sure what species he originates as, but then mm, Palpatine, Palpatine gives him the ability that he has, like, basically being a, a cyborg or an android of, of some kind, or I guess a cyborg, because that's more... Well, correct me if I'm creature. wrong, but, like, in the movie, he says, I've been trained in your Jedi arts by Count Dooku. Well, yeah, I'm so, I'm talking about like literally giving him his like shape and form, like how he went from being like a okay, biological yeah. entity to like a droid thing. But um, yes, and then you're absolutely right. Then he gets trained by Count Dooku. So it's just it's it's mm-hmm. all that to say that I think even all you know he did not have the ability. Like he probably did not ever have a high midi chlorian count, which is why he didn't get you know he couldn't force. He wasn't a force wielder, to my knowledge. He just knew the forms and the techniques. So I think that's the difference, and that's why Obi Wan wins, is because in the end, he can just force push him, and that gets him out of almost any situation. Sure, when it's convenient. Right, <laughs> when it's convenient for the stakes. When, when, when the plot demands. <sighs> of course, powers are plot blue. Uh, well, uh, the, force Henry- is, the force is weird. It it works when it wants to, or when it's convenient for the characters. But it's also and, like if you watch like Dragon Ball Z where people just say power levels are bullshit. Like <laughs> <laughs> it, it really is. He's over 9,000 ish. <laughs> I will yeah. say though, it is an interesting take on like, I, I get it. He's not like a Sith Lord, but like, you know, the antagonist who like isn't force sensitive, you know, like you are strictly just using your combat abilities, you know? Well, so here's so. an interesting question as I pass the time. He's like, both him, he's kind of the, one of the first um like non-force wielding sith acolyte type users especially one to wield a lightsaber one and two do you think the people the 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 species on utapal do you think that's the same type of species that the grand inquisitor was um i don't but i've done absolutely no research <laughs> it could be uh, if, if I, like, I, the grand inquisitor who from rebels uh, from rebels Jason uh, Isaac's again, character again. I I, I had no idea. I, I think that the Inquisitors like worm, teeth teeth worm. Did you're in such, for such a treat that first season of Rebels with Jason Isaacs as the Grand Inquisitor? Oh yeah, amazing. Mm. But anyway, sorry, not to totally divert up once again. But yeah, what are your it, thoughts on Grievous? <laughs> Shut up, Nave. <laughs> well, funny enough, Caden versus the Grand Inquisitor, I think, is the top three duels in Star Wars. But that's just an opinion. Um, but anyways, um, I think I think John Grievous not only was cool and not just that I him to sell toys, but I think he had a few purposes. One, I think it was to show that like Palpatine needed somebody to head the separatists after Count Dooku died. He knows this, and it goes back to Palpatine being a mastermind. It's like, okay, I need to see Anakin fight Dooku, but if he kills Dooku, is the war going to be over? No, I need somebody to hold it over long enough so that I can turn Anakin and conquer the Senate. So he's like, okay, and. I think he also knew that Obi-Wan was so close to Anakin and that if anybody could pull him back more so than Padme, it was Obi-Wan. So he was like, okay, I need you to go over there and don't come back. Like it's, I don't know if any of you have seen Beauty and the Beast and the Enchanted Christmas where Tim Curry is this gigantic evil pipe. Or he's like, make sure they don't come back. And that's literally what he wanted with the Jedi. Um, but I think the other purpose, like, is just to just show in general, just um, what other um, combatants out in the galaxy could fight Jedi. Like, I know, like in Episode Two, we got Jango versus Obi Wan. That was cool to see. But then we also see like other species, like not just General Grievous, but also his kind of like head acolyte people with the weapons that they had were kind of cool. And that did go off into various other fights, like when we watched The Mandalorian and you see uh, Din fight uh, Mob Gideon with the dark saber and that or he actually fights ahsoka for a second and his armor's able to hold up but there's also other weapons that can hold up against lightsabers so now it's like the possibilities are endless where it used to be nothing can like a lightsaber can go through anything 
it's not true. And not there are other ways to fight them. <laughs> Beskar and then the, the plasma uh, staff. Steel and, beams. Well, yeah, like there are all these other cool weapons that Grievous helped introduce. You got it, Bo. I think, I think that just made it made it better. Well, they, you know, not in this or any movie that I know, but they, if you go down this YouTube rabbit hole, they do talk about it at times, like pre lightsabers, which is like thousands of years ago, what the ancient Jedi and Sith would fight with, and it was like enchanted weaponry, and not just laser swords so much. And some of these like artifacts and weapons were like better and preferred by certain clans and certain, uh, like, you know, parts of uh, the galaxy, like in, in used to fight against lightsaber. But again, you could probably go down a super long rabbit hole with that one. But um, I think, I think, did we hit everybody with that one? I think so. All right. Hit me with your best shot. All right. So this is kind of another big question. These are all big questions, but Daniel, how did you like, Order 66 and just the overall, uh, you know, the failed assassination attempt of Chancellor Palpatine. See, um, I, so, I mean, I was kind of, so when I watched the movie theater, I kind of knew what I knew what to expect, you know, ish. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't think that it would happen so abruptly. Like, I didn't think that, you know, Palpatine would just, you know, bring up the, um, he, he would just uh, bring up the uh, communicator and go, like, execute Order 66, and then all of the clones just immediately, like, just turn. Um, yeah, no, I thought, uh, but I, I thought I thought that it was, I thought the way Palpatine did it, first, I'm always going to go back to Palpatine, uh, you know, especially with this movie, is, it was just, it was just masterfully done. Like, he, he got the uh, Jedi Order so integrated with the clone army that, you know, at any given point, you know, there's where you have Jedi, you're going to have clones. And, um, and then like, you know, F, then when uh, it's time for the war to end, he's like, all right, well, time for the master plan to get to kick you had, off. You hit the nail on the head. It's like the Jedi were so spread out even prior to, uh, well, I get, no, I guess it really is the crawl of this one where it's like war is everywhere. And just really trying to stress that like, just evil is, all over the galaxy right now and it's 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 tough for anybody so the jedi are just like you know one on this planet one on this planet and then like a battalion or a squadron of clones with them yeah and um and it was and they were and uh the clones were very thorough like they're i mean in, each time you know stories uh each time star wars has to make a new story they're like oh there's a jedi who escaped <laughs> and mm -hmm. um and that's that's a pretty common theme so there's there's an ever growing list of people who escaped, who escaped or 66. Um, but, uh, but you know, there's, there was literally like, what, what was the count of Jedi by the time the uh, clone wars were ending? Like, I know it was like, I know it started at thousands, but I'm not sure. And okay. rebels, Kane and Jarrus says that uh, by the end of the clone wars, there was 10,000. 10,000? 10,000 is what he says in the show. Oh. It's like huh. if you figure spread out with like you know millions of clone troops to like a couple ten thousand, that's that's not a great ratio. <laughs> no, that's not. Um, you know, especially since like the uh, the Jedi for most of it came as a surprise. You know, some of them were able to sense it. Like uh, like Yoda is a good example. Like you know, <laughs> Yoda oh, just yeah, like boy. yeah, they're just like you know has um, looks looks around and is like oh we're doing this now. <laughs> and then uh then heads literally start to roll um as for uh as for the failed uh, assassination attempt on uh palpatine um i i remember thinking like what does yoda intend to do really i mean sure he's gonna kill you know a uh, a uh, evil and powerful sith lord and get him out of you know the highest power the highest political position and that's certainly a good thing but i'm like is he only gonna try and like remake the uh, order after that, or is he gonna go into hiding? Because he's he's still gonna be a traitor at, at, at the end of that. I, I want to respond real quick um, because I've actually had this conversation. So I think what was gonna happen, and Dave Filoni actually said it about Mace. Like, had Mace killed Palpatine, Mace Windu would have gone to jail because he still would have killed someone unless he went into exile. But I think the only way for it to have been effective, like the Jedi Order, would have been shut down for sure. And Mace would have gone to jail. Um, 
which is literally him making the ultimate sacrifice where I always like for years and years and years thought that like the Jedi were just being corrupt because they wanted their power in reality. Mace Windu deep down was good because he wanted uh, to give up everything he had to save the rest of the galaxy from the oppression of the Sith. But on Yoda where order 66 had already happened and Mace is dead. I think what, like what would have happened is like having killed the emperor democracy would have resumed because he says the first galactic empire only moments before that, that had he killed him you would have had powerful senators like like uh amidala and bail organa Mahatma, and all these other people that were ready to fight for the democracy the problem was he had the influence over so many senators but if you don't have this big scary guy who probably revealed himself to them too who's being like hey, I'm going to kill you or zap you with lightning and put you through excruciating amounts of pain if you don't do exactly what the fuck I say. So it's like, I think with him out of the way, the Empire wouldn't have happened, even if he had killed him in that moment. The only problem, though, is Yoda doesn't kill him. He, he loses. Yeah. Well, well I, don't, I don't think you have the Empire necessarily. I'm going to probably take a second for this one just because that's it's a, a lot of interesting theories and everything. But I think it, one thing, like, yes... Uh, Mace Windu might have spent a little bit of time in jail, but it wouldn't have been. That very was Dave hard. Filoni's theory, not mine. Well, I, what I was gonna, I'm gonna fight Dave Filoni then, right now. <laughs> um, it would have been hard to prove that Darth Sidious was Palpatine and that Palpatine was a Sith Lord. And then you know, you talk about the clones being very thorough. Somebody did. The Jedi were extremely thorough. You think that they wouldn't have wiped all his computers and all his data logs and everything and like been able to really pinpoint okay so he legit organized this inner like there would have been overwhelming evidence to show why mace had to do what he did kind of thing because the jedi they they work in in you know kind of as a pair with the senate and the republic and everything but like the sith are they're like ancient enemy the sith and the jedi have been going at it longer than the republic's even been around so I have a very, I don't know, me personally, I have a hard time thinking that it would have been like this whole big, if if Mace would have just been allowed to kill him, I think that would have in many ways stopped a lot of terrible things from happening. Just the whole Empire's conquest of the galaxy. And it's, I don't know, that's my theory. But did you have anything else to say on um, Daniel? We were on, right? Yeah. Do you have Um, anything else to say about Order 66 or um, Um, Mace V? Sidious. Let me see. My uh, my only, the only yeah, the only thing I really wanted to add about Order sixty six was there was uh, so when I, so when I was watching the movie, and this is completely removed from my from my original points. When I was watching the movie, and uh, when I was watching the movie, and, um, Anakin, you know, going through the temple, uh, I'm like, yo, whoa, yo. At first, when he starts just killing Jedi, I'm like, oh wow, he's he's really going at it. Then he gets to the younglings, and I'm like, and uh, at first, they're like, Master Anakin, they're everywhere, or something to that tune. And instead of just responding, he just lights his lightsaber up. And I actually had to I had to stifle a laugh because everyone else around me is looking up the screen in object horror. And I'm just sitting there, like, trying to be like, <laughs> oh. Well, it's kind of unbelievable because up to that point, I mean, there have been some dark stuff in Star Wars, but that was, like, next level darkness where he's just like, well, I guess I got to kill all these kids. It did, like, it did Holy. feel... It didn't feel like him, man. Like, uh, oh. like even like like for the Game of Thrones, like when Daenerys does her thing. Oh, when she goes mad queen. Last, that that I had that moment with that for me. It was just like, and yeah. I think unfortunately oh, okay. that similar to the the same problem they did in Game of Thrones is they didn't spend enough time really like. And again, it's, it's really the Anakin as a bad guy. It's it's the time constraint thing because I'm sure if you added the deleted scenes, yeah. if you add an extra hour on this movie, it ends up being phenomenal. Uh, like again, I I will I'll go back to my uh, case for intermissions and yeah. longer movies. I'm here for it, man. Get some extra <laughs> raisinets or something. Better story <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, no. I, let's see. Uh, um. Also, sli- this is also slightly related. Just something I'm just throwing in there too. Uh, they do go back. They do make fun of it in the um in the Clone Wars uh, animated series. Um. Because uh, I remember at one point. Uh, at one point, um, Obi Wan's talking to Anakin about like um, going and teaching younglings, and he's like, "I can't do that. I'd probably kill them all." <laughs> and and uh, oh god, 
general <laughs> sassy one. Such a great, such a great show. <laughs> well, Henry, why don't you pick okay. it up from there? Order 66 and the failed coup. And the young ones. <laughs> He's killing young things. <laughs> But do you know that Ewan McGregor actually in that scene when he covers his mouth, he was trying to cover up him laughing. A laugh. Yeah. I can only imagine why. <laughs> but no, like I still think that Order Sixty Six was amazingly done. I think I'll remember. I'll never forget being in that theater and just watching it all happen because you know this is the prologue slash like Bible First Testament of Star Wars. It's like. It's Batman's parents being shot in the alley. It's the destruction of Krypton. It's all those prologue stories that you hear about that just like begins the journey. This was that thing. Ooba. Well, Ooba. <laughs> Ooba. Ooba. Austin, what do you think about, um, you know, just in general, the. Um, you know, the Order 66 and this failed assassination attempt on uh, Chancellor Palpatine. Well, I'll talk briefly about my midnight release experience. Wow, that sounds really bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, when, I saw Revenge of the Sith, when I saw Revenge of the Sith at midnight, <laughs> back when it came out. Um, Watching like, the I Padme knew, fire I, scene. I knew going into uh, Palpatine's office is like, oh my god, like these guys are not coming out alive because, like, how could you know, they? No, yeah, no yeah. one's in A New Hope, so like, of course, <laughs> like we're gonna lose this fight. And uh, they they did my boy Kit Fisto dirty, zero out of ten. He did. It always bothered me, just like <laughs> how it should have ended. Like, did it perfectly? That's how one guy died. Where they're like, all right. We we're gonna go and get Palpatine now. Don't just stand there and let him stab you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, damn uh, at it! Kit, at least Kit Fisto though gets like two blocks in, and then he gets like sliced in half. I was gonna say he lasted the longest of of the three who died right away. Right, they just did my favorite Jedi dirty. <laughs> that was not. You know, that was not nice. Another one of those yeah, things really. that would have been served well by a longer movie is having a longer interrogation period with them. Like, I would have loved to see Sidious and, and Mace Windu sit there and kind of like banter back and bit forth a bit more, like before the fireworks started going off, and then and then proceed into just this bonkers four v one where you literally get to see how powerful Sidious is against like even like slightly B tier care or a Jedi. It was too OP. Yeah, there, there was like not enough barrel rolls like during the actual lightsaber duel. <laughs> but in, You're in becoming s- more like your father. Stra- <laughs> strategically, it kind of makes sense in the sense that like, you know, take them out as many as you can as quick as possible so you don't tire yourself out. But still, it's a little little absurd <laughs> just how quickly yeah. you killed them. It's like, wait, wait, did you guys skip yeah. out on leg day? <laughs> like. <laughs> Or how about blocking um, day? How about that? <laughs> it's just like defense. Who needs defense? Oh, <laughs> yeah. You know, you fool! You've fallen for my trap card. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't do this problem, for you. I don't want to scare my niece and nephew. One problem I've always had is just Anakin's like turn to the dark side because it plays into this scene where it feels very abrupt to me. I don't know if I'm alone in that opinion, but it's no, kind of just you. like all like you're like, he must stand trial. And then he like cuts Mace Windu's hand off. What have I done? And then he's like, what have I done? Well, I was going to say like, Mr. Overcompensating because he had literally just murdered his like chief rival. And now is all of a sudden trying to be like this beacon and of, you know, democracy and due process. Right. <laughs> And it just bothers me that it's like out of nowhere, Sidious is like, "You're fulfilling your destiny, Anakin," and like, he's like, "All right, I'll do whatever you ask. That's fine." <laughs> it's just kind of like, what? That, that's that's yeah. That's and like, mind. all of a sudden, you, your moral compass has completely did a completely did a one eighty, and it's like now you're okay with killing like literally every single Jedi and the younglings. And it's just kind of like, I feel like this should not have happened overnight well and i think about like how we could have fixed that and in one way i just came up with like off the top of my head it would have been cool if like 
you know, so keep all the dialogue and all the setup to the point where Anakin's at when he walks in the room, he sees Mace fighting Sidious. I would have loved to see that fight go on just a little bit longer and Sidious be such a powerful opponent that Mace suddenly has to tap into a bit of the dark side in order to beat him. And that's mm-hmm. what turns him. Like, oh, the Jedi are corrupt because they're using the dark side and I can't use the dark side. And right. this is bullshit. Well, like, and then then he's like, okay. And then he turns and everything. But it was, as it stands on the screen, I think it was a little like, wait, so he's caring about his kid and wants to save his wife. So he's going to go murder about like, mass right it's like younglings. you are literally sacrificing well everybody to save one person my kids over <laughs> you <laughs> you know you could you could be peter parker at the end of spider-man ps4 where you're just like i could save aunt may or i could just you know save the entire city of new york but whatever you know but it's like you the know jedi are corrupt go I mean, kill all the jedi left and then go kill all the separatists and, and maybe, all- and maybe you'll save Padme. <laughs> right. And then maybe we can talk about that tomorrow over right. coffee. And and like the thing is, is that I feel like episode two almost got it right where we like see a little bit of inner turmoil within Anakin, like after he's killed the sand people, where it's just like, I'm a Jedi. I know I'm better than this. This movie, he's just okay with it. He's like, this is what I have to do to like save my uh, save my wife, my baby's mama, and like, I don't know. I feel like there needed to be more of like a kid is killing. this the right thing? Prior, but no, not more kid <laughs> killing. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe more women and children. <laughs> maybe it's, you know, maybe it's because we've been like going hard on Harry Potter for at least three episodes, four episodes now. You know, it kind of makes me like the reason Harry Potter works towards the end is because of all the stuff he went through. And yes, he was very prolific and all this stuff, but like he had a lot of bad stuff done to him constantly over and over and over. And you see literally nothing but adversity for him for eight movies. Anakin Skywalker, in almost every instance that he was in, he was an OP at everything pod racing, but, fixing but if things I'm... and everything. And like, so in the movie, you know, he has the moment after the sand people. He has a little bit of a moment after he kills Dooku and stuff. And obviously a lot through this move, but it would have really been nice to see him just like beat down a whole lot more and him have to like overcome things, but still be kind of on the fence rather than just like, he just kind of glides through, glides through and then it changes. And it's like, well, okay. Like, I guess. Well, but If I may Spencer, but like, I remember since we're talking about Harry Potter real quick, um, in order of the Phoenix, we have that scene between Harry and Sirius where like, you know, Harry's not like, you know, quote unquote, turning to the dark side or whatever, but he's having this inner debate where he's like, maybe I am becoming more like Voldemort, you know, cause he's just like, I'm so angry all the time, but like, we don't get that with Anakin. We get just like the, yeah, I'm angry. And you know what? Maybe I am just evil now. Like there's no like internal debate. Or there's no questioning, like, what am I doing, you know? Well, like, what if from the get-go, they were much closer in age, like, at least visually, even from episode one, Anakin and Padme were. And so that way, in episode two, she has the babies and gives twins and everything. But the end of episode two, something like Jango Fett or somebody kills her. And then all of episode three is Anakin kind of dealing with that. And that's what turned. Like, I get that they kind of did it in stages with his mom and then with her. But, like, you could have really, like, you could have made episode two of this like big trollopy fan fest. Like they did all this crazy stuff and like, you know, they have kids towards the end and then Padme gets axed somehow like violently and brutally in front of Anakin where he can't do anything and he has to watch. And then episode three is like, and and maybe it's just the answer is they didn't want to put that in a PG movie. And I'm just kind of a nihilist. I'm like, take her head off. But (laughs) But I don't know. I mean, it is undoubtedly a bit of a abrasive shock when he's just goes from being like he's he's like Mace Windu says, if this is correct, I will trust you. All the stuff mm-hmm. I've said and done, I will trust you. Just if this is correct, if you are sure and you fulfilled your role that the council gave you, we will, you know, his trajectory would have been straight off the chart at that point because they would have ended the war in, mm-hmm. in many ways. They would have ended the war and he fucked it up. But yeah. Yep. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, relating it back to Order sixty six, this is going to sound kind of messed up, but like it's beautiful 
but it's tragic at the same time. And I feel like that's why we see it come back in like spin off whatever they may be novels, video games. I there's probably a ton of TV stuff, yeah. shows that are like around it as well. I, again, I don't know. Um, but like even as recent as uh, Jedi Fallen Order, you know, we get Cal Kestis as an apprentice, you know, going through Order 66. So it's such a pinnacle turning point in just the Star Wars lore, the Star Wars history. And for me, that's like where everything changes. That's where like the that's kind of like where, you know, like the era of the prequel trilogy, you know, the Clone War era start really like excuse me hold on let me back up that's oh. where like the st- the clone wars comes to an end there and then all of a sudden we are in galactic empire a new hope era yeah this movie and is the turning point it's pretty like, literally it is like and it's like a flick of a switch you know mm-hmm. you massacre the entire jedi order and now we're in a new hope territory yeah and least- i it's, yeah, it's, Galactic it's, Empire territory. It's such a far-reaching event, like because like people in this episode have said, just random pockets where some of these Jedi were like they actually did survive. A is super interesting, and then you think about the fact that even in this movie, they show us like six or seven different scenarios where you have a Jedi like by themselves getting swarmed upon in various different ways in a starship, on a speeder bike, just walking through the Felucian jungle and stuff like. They were just getting off all sorts of different ways. So, like, just the terrifying, like, nature of all that. But it's kind of, like, it makes me think a lot of the end of The Godfather, where, you know, Michael Corleone has all the different mob bosses killed at the same time while he's at church or whatever. And it's kind of exactly the same thing where Palpatine's just like, okay, I have this automatic, like, emergency break for the entire, you know, expanded Jedi base. Mm -hmm. You just go take out this one building and kill everybody that's there. And kind of set up a booby trap as well with like clones stationed there and setting up the signal to bring them back. It's it's just wild. Like it took it, it definitely took me a while to kind of appreciate this movie and especially like Palpatine's plot. But having years and years to like sit on it and just kind of mull it over in my head, like it's this movie does so much in the name of like you know the progression of evil things happening in this world because mm-hmm. you're it's right. Like- this ends and yeah. then it's it's empire time for yeah. 30 isn't, isn't years. It cr- isn't it crazy though that we actually get a brief moment where like even one of the clones is kind of like debating whether or not he's doing the right or wrong thing with uh Bail Organa when he arrives at the Jedi Temple and Bail is like, What's going on here? And that clone trooper is just like, I'm sorry, sir, it's time for you to leave. It's just like, I don't want to shoot you, but I will, you know, if <laughs> if you try and get past me that yeah just, i mean I, you know just the the brain chip that they had in them that that made that toggle switch go off in their personalities just be like these you know completely subservient uh to to darth Sidious and go off on these guys it was kind of like the winter soldier it's like they read off the couple words and he just becomes like this killing machine all of a sudden. So they're just totally brainwashed. It's right. right. And I know, I know we've been on this point forever, but it's just, it's upsetting that, you know, we get someone who isn't a clone trooper, who's a Jedi, like on the brink of becoming Jedi master, who doesn't have this like question of morality, but mm-hmm. we get this random trooper who does. It's just kind of like, maybe we could have reversed the role there a little bit. Well, and it's interesting too, because again, I know you haven't watched clone wars, but when you, you know, do you'll kind of realize like once you have that in your back pocket of like just the knowledge base of the canon timeline and everything, if Ahsoka wouldn't have been framed in like season five, end of season five, I think. Yeah. And didn't spend two seasons or so away from Anakin. There's no saying that like he might've been on the right path the whole time, but like that coupled with everything, of course that happens in the movies and everything it it really does help sell just how like in a predicament he was, but specific to this movie. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's pretty baffling just how many things kind of get tied up here, like in nice knots of like all these questions they've been asking for the previous two movies. But did, um, did I miss anybody on this? I know there was an abrupt uh, personnel change there. Did anybody um, else talk about the uh, order 66 and. Uh, see, uh, did we, uh, did we, did we hit Bo? Yeah, did Bo go yet? Um, I mean, I feel, I thought I 
did maybe I didn't. Well, I I just know I just didn't. I was just I hated seeing uh, Mace Windu lose, man. Yeah, and, that's uh, and that's disappointing. Also touched on how abrupt the switch was um, for the turn. Uh, but like I said, due to time constraints, you know, it's it's just they had to cut stuff out, you know, and it kind of, it's hard when they when you have that, you don't have that a freedom to do it. So you have to be really valuable with your, your time in the movie. So yeah. yeah. That's it's it's unfortunate, but I do still think they did a pretty good job finishing up everything. I mean it was pretty oh, yeah, I, yeah, I mean I loved it, but still. pretty telegraphed throughout the series what like just knowing as much as we did about the original trilogy. Like we kind of knew a lot of the big players where they would end up and and that kind of thing. But it's I still think it, it did a pretty good job. So let's um since we kind of shortchanged Bo in the last question, it was kind of crazy. Let's put you know. in the hot seat for this one. Both uh, Darth Sidious versus Yoda and Darth Vader versus Obi-Wan. What are your well, thoughts on these two fights? Hey, man, those, the the little, the, the Senate fight was a little pretty crazy. Seeing two masters go out throwing these just giant objects at each other. <laughs> yeah, just... <laughs> <laughs> um uh, that, that was cool i mean you get to see how powerful you know they are that you know manipulating that um and they fought too right they did fight they have they were fighting and throwing shit at each other yeah they legit fought for probably so five fighting. to ten minutes yeah <clears throat> yeah so that was a crazy scene that was that was cool so even though like i said i'm not a, a yoda style is not it's just not for me personally so it right. like, makes me hate it <laughs> Um, but uh, and then obviously the the Obi Wan and uh, that 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 last fight when Obi comes out of that ship, I was like, oh damn, it's going down. And it, um, it's kind of wild how like Yoda fights Darth Sidious in this one, and then he goes into exile after that. He trains Luke, but that's really all he does, other than kind of help Obi Wan to learn how to commune with Qui Gon. But yeah, yeah, it's, it's the last like big hurrah for him, really. Mm -hmm. And um. And then yeah, Darth Vader, Obi Wan. I mean, what more could you ask for? We got that last fight that we wanted. Uh, Anakin just got too hot headed, bro. He thought he could pull one on him. He thought he could do the barrel roll like uh, Mr. Sidious. But dang. well, and, and Austin, I'll let you go next. I, you know, Obi Wan was only just barely better than Darth Vader in this fight. Just barely. If this happened like a week later, I think Darth Vader might take it. And you know what's funny about that? Uh, I keep making references to the uh, bonus features on like the DVD, but actually, I don't, I don't remember the choreographer's name, but he actually says that like Anakin has passed Obi Wan as far as like swordsmanship because mm -hmm. I think he labels Obi Wan as like level nine as far as like swordsmanship or lightsaber ist. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but like yeah, Anakin is actually better than him considering their sword play um just a random tidbit of knowledge that i have but in my heart the anakin versus obi-wan fight is the best uh just sword fight ever put to film i really think it is like i said in my heart it is the only one that can counter that is the princess bride which <laughs> spoiler alert we're gonna get to <laughs> i can't wait um you know, it's it's so good. Yeah, it's choreographed, you can tell. But it's like, this is what I've been waiting for. Like, even as someone who didn't grow up with the original trilogy, it's like, this is what, like, all these movies have finally, like, been trying to get through this entire time, is watching these two best friends just essentially try and kill each other. And Honestly. you know, you know Obi-Wan doesn't want to kill Anakin. He says and that's much, what, yeah. Right, and like that's what makes it all the more tragic. It's just like, he even says it like, you know, send me to kill the Emperor. I can't kill Anakin. No, you're my brother, Anakin. I loved you. I hate you. Yeah. <laughs> boy was angry. Boy had no like, damn oh. legs. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, it's, it's crazy because if, if, if Darth Vader did win this, I think that he becomes even more terrifyingly powerful than Darth Vader ended up be mm -hmm. becoming because he had so many hindrances as far as just like his mobility issues, his respiratory and all that kind of stuff. But if, if, if Darth Vader found a way to win before, like if he wins this fight, he like, I don't know if Luke ever defeats Darth Vader. I think he's just, cause he's not just confined to the castle behind me. He literally goes off 
and is just murdering for the next 19 years. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's so weird watching a sword fight for the first time where, like, yes, Obi-Wan does win, but at the same time, it's like neither of these guys are going to win. Like, neither, both of these guys are going to come out of this alive. But, like, mm-hmm. there's so much at stake at the same time, and I think that's why it works so well. That's why it's still oh, yeah. so engaging. Well, Daniel, and, go, sorry, go. Uh, were you, go ahead and finish Oh, I, I, I had mentioned uh, Sidious and Yoda. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. I, I also love that fight as well. I think it's a little more underwhelming compared sure. to Anakin and Obi-Wan, sure. But, like, again, those guys are, like, younger actors, so you can, like, ask more out of them. You know, um, yeah, one of them was like, a CGI orange on a stick, right? One of them wasn't a CGI space wizard, and one wasn't a giant frog. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I do like how you kind of like see the destruction of like the Republic going on in that sword fight as well, mm-hmm. where Sidious is just like, you know what, screw all of this, screw this council chamber. <laughs> I was just imagine, imagine the senator coming in the next day. Mm. Hey, where's my chair? <laughs> another one. You will get another chair when I say you get another chair. It always confused me, though. Just the last little bit. At the end of the day, I do love the fight. I do love the entrance of Yoda where he just like force pushes the two bodyguards. Yeah, the <laughs> like, yeah, really like, that, that, that was like that was my favorite part. I remember the theater just bursting in laughter when that happened that is probably one of the best scenes of that movie Um, hey hold this (laughs) it's always weirded me out not weirded me out because but like yoda just feels the need to go into exile after he loses and why that part has never been explained to me that was his best shot i mean how is he going to get another shot at sidious i mean because he lost his cape (laughs) <laughs> well, I mean, like, how does how does he get like Sidious at that point then has like complete like he kind of took him by surprise, just not knowing Sidious probably assumed he got killed on Kashyyyk. I'm just guessing maybe there's a lot of death going on. So I'm sh- I wonder how perceptive he was as to who per- specifically had died. So he kind of has the like edge of surprise a, a, a little bit, uh, the element of surprise. Sorry. Um, and that's really the biggest reason I think he even had a mm-hmm. shot at him right there. And then, and he says, mm-hmm. I failed. I must go into exiles because I think a, he knows that he's more used to everybody alive and, you know, B obviously it would be a lot harder after that attack. Cause think of all the, like, Oh, uh, the emperor or whatever has been, has been attacked. We must consolidate all our security and refor- resources. Even Yoda, I don't think in battle. You know what? Now that I'm thinking about it, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, you're fine. But I guess now Yoda could probably be framed for like an assassin assassination attempt. Yeah. On uh Palpatine. Mm-hmm. Because I guess at this point he still has control of you know the Senate and the courts. I was gonna say I think he had just um, turned himself framed? into the Emperor at that point. It was an assassination attempt. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess that makes sense where like Yoda's gonna be framed and you know sent to Jedi prisoned. And- yeah, if he showed his face anywhere with Galactic Empire, uh, you know, sympathizers, he, he would have been called out and then just chased endlessly. So he's like, you know what? I'm going into exile. I can kind of commune with the dead already. I'm going to try and bide my time and see how we can make a plan rather than just running in rashly. Because he's always been the one who's like, use your mind, clear your mind, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. He was probably just lost for everything like everything he had worked so hard to build and foster just like a brutally uprooted by darth vader yep. in like a single night so yeah. he becomes a puppet after he uh, loses well we all love yoda i'm so glad we got to see what we did we all love him. puppet yoda um, <laughs> i think was it daniel did we still need you to, you to talk yeah. about the two fights yeah um you see, actually, uh, so going off of, uh, so picking back up from what uh, Austin said about the uh, the fight, about the fights, and um, about and uh, about the idea of why he why he felt the need to isolate after after the after the um, the attempted assassination of uh, Emperor Palpatine. It's like part of me, part of me wonders. Do you think you do you think Yoda realized that if he had gotten involved with like any kind of um, any kind of rebel? Uh, you know any kind of early rebel alliance or you know the rebel alliance itself do you think that 
you think that if he, if he had done that, um, you know, part of me thinks maybe he might have been a bigger target because, you know, the force is f- Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, I feel like if if uh, if Yoda was like anywhere involved with with um, with the rebels, then, you know, Palpatine's just like, oh, I can pretty much figure out where you are. Um, I think one of the only reasons that they didn't uh, that that they never went to uh, the Empire, never went to Dagobah was because Yoda surrounded himself with so much life force that it just got that his own like signature just got lost in the static. It was um, an uncolonized planet, just full of you know primitives, I'm sure, and you know, like you said, no reason to really suspect that he'd be there. Yeah, there's there's that. Part of me also wonders, like maybe he didn't maybe he didn't get involved with um with the uh, Rebel Alliance because he was just so tired of war. I mean, he just fought fought one war. I mean, I, his team won, but his uh, his team won, but his group lost. Um, you know, so tired of war. He's so tired of killing. I mean, he's like Yoda isn't ex- Yoda's very good at combat, but he's not exactly a killing machine. He doesn't doesn't think that way. Well, and the Jedi were so focused on like the concept of honor because they are kind of George Lucas's like space pirate, you know, take on the samurai kind of. So, yeah. you know, the concept of like, oh my gosh, I brought so much dishonor to everything by like, you know, letting this, because he, he kept saying like the shroud of the dark side has fallen. I can't say the cloudy, the dark side is like, he's trying to figure it out the whole time, but he's always a step behind as much as we want him to like be like this, you know, perfect omnipotent being like that was his flaws. He couldn't figure out between people saying, Oh, the prophecy, the prophecy all the time. And, you know, like you said, handling himself in this war and trying to keep all the, what, what Jedi he had alive. Cause he was taking huge losses all the time and he had defections and. Oh yeah. Uh, and it, the was, it, it was tough. So, I mean, as he's almost like, he's not this, a Ronin was a samurai without a master. He was the equivalent of that, but the opposite way around. He had no more pupil because he, what was he going to teach Obi-Wan? He had new training for him a little bit, but I mean, that that's all he could really teach for the most part. Those are the only two Jedi they knew for sure were around because Ahsoka was kind of took off. Ahsoka was doing her own thing at that point. I'd see, uh, they had I, no I, I, idea who was still alive. I mean, they were so low tech at that point. Let me see. I, I actually know what Ahsoka does at the end. I know uh, canonically, uh, comically, I always get that confused. Canonically? I, canonically, <laughs> yeah, there we go. Canonically. I know canonically how, um, like, what, what Ahsoka was doing at the end of that, and she, like, even though she's, you know, not associated with the Order anymore, she's still considered a Jedi. And, she's a uh, great Jedi, yeah. Yeah, she's still considered a, a Force user that's not on Palpatine's good list. Um... And so she uh, she actually, you know, ends up um, just she ends up like, you know, going to several different worlds and just literally just living as a uh, as a mechanic for for the longest time. Eventually, she gets tired of it. See, eventually a, uh, a Grand Inquisitor, you know, eventually she does something that saves a kid's life. Grand Inquisitor's like, oh, hey, there might be a Jedi over there. And um, then she then she gets, you know, in a fight with a Grand Inquisitor. I think at that point, then she starts. Was that her book or? Yep. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, we had super interesting character, but um, uh, yeah, I guess, no. guess just to kind of wrap this section, I, I absolutely love these two fights. And I think, you know, I, I'm always a big person to rank things. I, I think Austin said it, the Darth Vader Obi-Wan fight is gotta be the best lightsaber duel we've had in any movie to date. It is two, well, a Jedi and a Sith at their primes and it just so happens that Obi-Wan has a little bit more experience than Darth Vader does. And he knows how to counter a high, a low to high ground attack. Like it's kind of like the art of Sun Tzu. He knows exactly how to block that because he used that attack on Darth Maul. I was and, really know, hoping someone would say that. <laughs> so it's, it's just kind of, he's like, oh, what if Darth Maul just cut me in half if I jumped over? But he was such a, you know, arrogant young Sith at the time, but. Oh, yeah. and, two... and he sucker punched Maul. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> these these two fights are uh, just, I don't know, the outstanding. I thought that what was nice is that you have one that's like two, two badasses who are just like the peak of what saber wielding was like. And then juxtaposed with 
the emperor and Yoda who are much more like kind of force wielders and lightsabers are kind of their secondary like master means. wizards because he's like <laughs> I, I can get in close and you know in your face with my lightsaber or I can just stand up here and wing these giant discs at you I'm going to do that because that's a little bit safer for me. So, and you know, of course Yoda is at the end of his tenure anyways, who knows how much of a toll this took on his life essence after losing to Darth Sidious, but you know, he, he dies 19 years later. So he was old for his species and everything. So, you know, it's, Harry. it's pretty, uh, it's pretty insane to just kind of break down this whole movie. I had one more question about, you know, Padme and how her, you know, her pregnancy and her babies led into the next film, but I think we kind of touched on that just a little bit with how, you know, poignant and necessary and important that whole sequence is and her dying and stuff. But I'd, you know, I don't know how much more we really need to dwell on that. So <laughs> I'm going to skip. You lost the will to live. Science. Lost, lost the will to talk about Padme making, you know, faces in the camera while. Uh, yes. Uba. <laughs> just having she like didn't know she was having twins but happens to have a boy and a girl's name immediately yeah just, and, but, and, it, and despite the just, fact she's having twins she doesn't really show all that well either i thought that was kind of that was that's a small plot hole for me it's like they don't have sonograms on coruscant like they didn't know she was having twins or did she just like not want to have a gender reveal party i don't know well, well the thing was like i said that's what i was going to ask about when you when she was pregnant how many months like because that there in episode three how many days or months went by because like at least nine point, i think <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah so was that on a ninth month and she's just telling him that she's pregnant that's what like it's like apparently force choking is great to put your lady into labor Hey, well, you know, that and that's that's the thing. I kind of, it's like they almost had it. I wish they had say the they had said like you know like when you force choked her, like you did some like internal damage that she'll like never recover from, or like he legit like, oh, killed her, not just broke her heart, whatever the hell that was about. Yeah, it's just like you like collapsed her like her trachea, and like now she can't breathe. <laughs> like, oh my god, he snapped her spinal column. Get these babies out of her. <laughs> Yeah, like I feel. I mean, Holy he crap. removed it been, the will. From it would have been a graphic for a Star Wars movie, but it's just like if you like did some internal damage, like it would have been like okay, so they, like they she's put up like an legit X-ray and her body is just like mangled and st- oh my god, oh, it's, it, it's like a Mortal Kombat fatality. This is X-ray a droid attack. Yeah. This is Padme. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like where this is going. Oh, good boy. <laughs> Barrier shield and cage. <laughs> I can see it now in Mortal Kombat, just Anakin's like, finish him. He's just like, I hate you. And then, like, you see, like, sand. Like, <laughs> like, like, Dale Gribble and King of the Hill just pocket sand. <laughs> oh, no, my weakness. <laughs> well, uh, guys, I think it's a good place to go into our final segment, which is typically just give your overall thoughts on the film and what you really liked about it. If there was any final points you wanted to make, uh, let's go counter. No, let's go clockwise. Let's go Austin first. Well, Kermit as Sidious makes this a much better movie. No, I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> Not wrong. <It's> hard. <laughs> you, um, have all... <laughs> you know, all, all jokes aside and all criticisms aside, I absolutely adore this movie. I placed it uh, third. I believe in like my overall rankings uh, just beneath a new hope and rogue one. And again, it sits comfortably there, you know, watching this as at 10 years old, it was kind of like, this is fucking awesome. (laughs) I have so many good memories that I associate with this movie, you know, the midnight release and just like, just diving into like all the bonus content that came on that dvd like just hours upon hours of just like watching how this movie was made it's it's such a thrill ride and you know not having like all these questions needing answered from the og trilogy for me being so young uh i think i had such an overwhelmingly positive experience watching this movie and you know i'm I am a prequel defender at the end of the day. This mm-hmm. is the best one at the end of the day. <laughs> and uh, gosh, I don't know. I just. 
Well, they've aged really like, well for me yeah. as well, you know, and I yeah. I think I, I also, this is definitely my favorite of the prequel trilogy, and I, I rank it fifth behind the original trilogy in Rogue One, and that is saying a lot because I do kind of adore certain other aspects of some of the other films, both in this trilogy and the sequel trilogy, but this one, outside of the original three in Rogue One for me, is pretty much, you know, top tier Star Wars. Like, it's crazy that the top five films in this franchise are this good, in my opinion. You know, again, some of the execution may be a little bit spotty and stuff, but this film in particular, like the dialogue and just the what it really does set up. And, you know, I know a whole generation of people who did, like Austin, grow up on this film. They didn't have the original beforehand. So people, yeah, they adore it because of their own reasons, nostalgia reasons. Maybe they connected with characters differently as kids and then, you know, as they grew up, it just, you know, it does, if you're into this kind of, mm-hmm. you know, subject matter, Star Wars specifically, the franchise, it's, there's so much to unpack with these first three movies and, and this one in particular, both the like kind of ethos behind it and all sorts of stuff. But Daniel, what, um, what are your final thoughts? The, uh, my final thoughts on this particular movie, there were, so there are definitely things that they could have done better. But overall, I'd have to give it like an A rating. It was like, I remember like watching it from start to finish and going like, wow, that was, that was the conclusion of the prequels. You know, and, um, and of course, and uh, and you, you said it perfectly older, like how, like uh, that they've, you know, they've aged pretty well for you. And I, I feel the exact same way. And um, there's even some parts now that I'm get that I'm understanding that are, that make the movie so much better. Like being able to look at, uh, being able to look at Palpatine's, you know, his like all of the things that make him up, you know, th- that he did in this film. Like that's a lot of that was stuff I didn't get when I was a kid. <laughs> I, you know, I was there for, uh, for lightsabers and starfighters, and, you know, that was it. And as I've grown older, I'm like, you know, I'm looking more at the entry going, all right, <laughs> this is actually way deeper than I anticipated. So yeah, no, um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this movie. Um, and I will like, and, I, and a lot of people do uh, do rag on the prequels a bit. And I'm like, why? They're, they're good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I like things about them that I don't, or like more than I do the original trilogy and vice versa. And it's just, you know, sometimes I think a lot of times for me, it comes down to nostalgia, just why I love those first three so much. But these really, I mean, they're, they're not a huge drop off in quality. I mean, we were talking about it a lot, you know, two weeks ago about Attack of the Clones and how that's just, you know, it, it's arguably not one of the best Star Wars movies, but it's still wildly enjoyable at parts, you know, and, and just to kind of like have slogged through that a bit to get to this where it's just everything's going off was pretty awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Bo. Uh, yeah, man. Like I said, as a Star Wars fan, man, it's, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And like I said, it's also my favorite out of the prequels for sure. Um, just just because you know i mean like i said it's just this is where everything we know what's going to happen and we just want to see how it all plays out and um you know seeing mace windu fall like i said it pisses me off it makes me so mad it really makes me mad man that's understandable well, hey, i mean you might get him you might get him you yeah. don't know you mm-hmm. don't see him die that's he true yeah shot out of the and, window that's what i'm hoping and maul definitely still, survived big he still had like it with out mm-hmm. limbs he still mm. had a hand too. Like he wasn't just handless yeah. or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And Palpatine has died twice at this point. Yeah. <laughs> I cannot hold any longer. He's like um, one one death away from being Loki. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, man, like I said, it, it's my favorite out of the prequels. And as a, I think I think real real Star Wars fans, they'll 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 like it. They'll love it because at the end of the day, it's we're passionate about it is because we we do truly do love it. And that's why we're just you're just more critical on things that you actually care about. Sure. You know, well, and I, I hope I really do hope that people will go and look at some of the like even people who might like write off animated series and stuff like that as he being like a, a waste of time or being for kids. If you're interested in this story, I would highly recommend checking out Star Wars the Clone Wars, which is an animated series as well as Star Wars Rebels, which is an animated series on Disney Plus. And I'm not even just trying to like, you know, kowtow to our lords at Disney or anything, but 
those shows really build out a lot of the characters in the prequel trilogies, especially Anakin for me, like really well. So I, I think it would be a real treat for everybody to like kind of go back to that occasionally and just kind of like work your way through slowly because it's it's quite a grind to get through Clone Wars. But man, the end of season seven is so good. It's oh my god, I can't even get into it. Just the whole siege of Mandalore and Ahsoka coming toe to toe with Maul for you know the last time between the well no not the last time because they fight on uh, the one world when. They find old master Darth Maul way later on when Ahsoka confronts Darth Vader for the one and only time. I don't know. Yeah. I'm getting off on a tangent again, but it's good. It's good to watch. I, I agree. I'm glad I no, watched it's, it. It's fantastic. I can't wait to get Austin's thoughts as he eventually goes through it one day. One day. Yeah. Uh, it took me there. a while. It took I'll me like a there. month or so to get it, through. It's them. quite a while. Yeah. Well, and you got to make it through this, the first season. Yeah. yeah. It starts <laughs> off slow, but like, you know, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Ahsoka's character is not exactly like just immediately like, yay, Ahsoka. It takes a oh, while to kind of annoying. Kinda, yeah. Yeah. But it's worth Fuck. it by the end. Yeah. It is. Well, thank you everybody so much for joining us. I know we've had a couple twists and turns along the way, both in personnel and otherwise, but we're so glad if you made it all the way through. Thank you so much. <laughs> With um, the mid- <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, twists and turns. Bo doing his best 920 impression. <laughs> okay, I don't want to do it. I'm just late. It's like holding a, a plug or something. Like oh, it's like a tripod. That's all I got. I'll oh. get a lightsaber one day. Ah. <laughs> I thought it was something completely different. Hey, yeah, you got to make do with what you can. But anyways, thank you everybody so much. Please like, subscribe on the YouTube page. We are on all your favorite podcasting channels. We are on Facebook. We are on Twitter. Thinking about doing a Discord. If there's some you know interest in that, please let us know. But otherwise, thank you so much for joining us. And remember to be excellent to each other. Good night, Thanks, everybody. Guys. And party on, Hi, dudes. Guys. Yeah, man.